President Joe Biden's Deputy Press Secretary has resigned after threatening a female journalist who was asking him some questions about his personal life. He said this, no words can express my regret, my embarrassment and my disgust for my behaviour. Judah's confession in verse 26 of Genesis 38 is a similarly costly and humiliating confession, to use the words of Joyce Baldwin in her Genesis commentary. She is more righteous than I. That is a costly and humiliating confession. He's speaking, first of all, of a Canaanite. A Canaanite more righteous than Judah uh, from the godly family of Jacob. A Canaanite woman who deliberately committed immorality. Deliberately. Immorality of the sort we've seen. She is more righteous than I. A Canaanite woman who deliberately committed immorality by posing as a religious prostitute. She is more righteous than I. How did Judah get so low? This chapter tells us. First of all, by choosing the wrong influencers. By choosing the wrong influencers. You've heard of these um, uh, social media influencers uh, that have great influence over their followers. Well, Judah chooses the wrong influences. Verse 1, at that time, Judah left his brothers. That's his first mistake. He left his brothers. He didn't want their influence. He didn't want the influence of that family anymore. He left his brothers. Why? Well, I'm sure partly through guilt. Remember how the previous chapter has uh, closed, verse 35. Uh, verse uh, 34, they brought uh, Joseph's uh, blood-stained uh, cloak. Jacob, verse 34 says, tore his clothes, put on sackcloth, mourned for his son many days. All his sons and daughters came to comfort him. He refused to be comforted. No, he said, in mourning will I go down to the grave to my son. So his father wept for him. Noel Weeks says this, guilt is hard to live with at any time. It is even harder to live with when there is something to remind us of it. And yet we can make no confession. So these brothers lived with their father's sorrow as a constant reminder of their sin. No wonder Judah wanted to leave. This is, this is unbearable to see my father sorrowing over something Judah himself had suggested. Let's sell him, let's sell him to these Midianites uh, and make some money. Judah up and left. In doing so, think about it, Judah left the visible church. Jacob's family is the visible church on earth at this time. There may have been other believers uh, like Melchizedek, uh, the priest of God. But this is the visible church. Judah, uh, Judah leaves. He leaves his brothers. At that time, Judah left his brothers and went down to stay with a man of Adullam named Hira. This is geographically and morally downhill because Adullam, uh, sorry, Hira, the Adullamite, is a Canaanite and he becomes his friend. Uh, notice what it says there in verse 12, at the end of verse 12, um, after his wife died, he went up to Timnah to the men who were shearing his sheep, the end of verse 12, and his friend Hira, the Adullamite, went with him. Again in verse 20, meanwhile Judah sent the young goat by his friend, the Adullamite. He leaves his brother and he stays with a man of Adullam named Hira. That word stayed with, it can mean he pitched up, he pitched up with him, it said his tent there. It's also The word is also used of turning aside. Later in the Old Testament it's used of turning aside from the right way. Perhaps there's a hint of that in uh, what he's doing. He's turning aside, he's leaving his brothers. He's turn, turning aside morally as well as geographically. 
So here is he, he turns away from his family, the influence of his family, that godly family, even though uh, his brothers aren't that godly, his father. And he uh, uh, pitches up with Hira. Then, at verse 2, there Judah met the daughter of a Canaanite man named Shua. He married her. His friend is a Canaanite. His wife is a Canaanite. Remember how that had grieved uh, Isaac when Esau took Canaanite wives. That was a grief to them. Well, Judah now, no, Canaanite wife. Canaanite friend, Canaanite wife. Judah gets into the mess he does because he chooses the wrong influences. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 33, do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. What do you watch, read, listen to, play? Who do you spend time with? All those things will influence you. And Judah chooses who his influencers will be. Not his family, not his father. A Canaanite as his friend. A Canaanite as his wife. Bad company corrupts good character. And we need to think about that. What are we allowing to influence us? What are we choosing to influence us? Judah got as low as he did because he chose the wrong influences. But then also, secondly, because he drew the wrong conclusions. He got so low by drawing the wrong conclusions. And this is in regard to the death of his sons. He assumed that the death of his sons was because of Tamar. The problem was with her not with them. And that becomes clear after his, two, his first two sons die. Notice what happens in verse 11. Judah then said to his daughter-in-law Tamar, live as a widow in your father's house until my son Shelah grows up, for he thought he may die too, just like his brothers. So Tamar went to live in her father's house. He thought, she's the problem. Uh, so you, you go away, Tamar. Uh, and it becomes clear that he's got no intention of marrying his son to her uh, because she, she knows that. First of all, verse 12, after a long time uh, in that condition, he left her there. End of verse 14, Tamar saw that though Shelah had grown up, she had not been given to him as his wife. And Judah's confession makes that clear in verse 26. She is more righteous than I since I wouldn't I wouldn't give her to my son, Shelah. He thinks the problem is with Tamar, whether he's uh, uh, superstitious or something, but that's the problem. She's the problem. I need to preserve my son, Shelah, my last son, my surviving son, uh, uh, and so I'm not going to let him uh, marry her. He assumes the problem is with Tamar. Well, why were his sons put to death? Uh, his Canaanite wife uh, conceives, gives birth to three sons, Er, uh, Onan, and Shelah. We're told in verse 6, Judah got a wife for Er, his firstborn, and her name was Tamar. But Er, Judah's firstborn, was wicked in the Lord's sight, so the Lord put him to death. It's interesting how we've seen the problem with the firstborn in Genesis so far, Cain. <laughs> He was the firstborn. Ishmael was Abraham's firstborn. Esau was Isaac's firstborn. Reuben was Jacob. There's a problem with the firstborn. Again, it's revealing the, the, the strength of humanity, uh, the, 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 the cream of humanity. It's broken and fallen. He was wicked in the Lord's sight. No further information is given here. But the phrase itself is very revealing. He was wicked in the Lord's sight. He was evil in the eyes of the Lord. 
Listen to how Moses uses that phrase uh, later on in the book of Deuteronomy, in Deuteronomy chapter 4 and verse 25. The Israelites are on the border of the land of uh, promise, and uh, Moses says this in Deuteronomy 4 verse 25, after you have had children and grandchildren and have lived in the land a long time, if you then become corrupt and make any kind of idol doing evil in the eyes of the Lord your God and provoking him to anger, I call heaven and earth as witnesses against you this day that you will quickly perish from the land that you are crossing the Jordan to possess. So clearly connected with uh, idolatry. Uh, chapter 9 in uh, Deuteronomy. Moses is recalling what happened at Horeb when the Israelites made their golden calf. Uh, he says in uh, Deuteronomy 9 verse 16, When I looked, I saw that you had sinned against the Lord your God. You had made for yourselves an idol cast in the shape of a calf. You turned aside quickly from the way the Lord had commanded you. Verse 18 of Deuteronomy 9, then once again I fell prostrate before the Lord for 40 days and 40 nights. I ate no bread and drank no water because of all the sin you had committed, doing what was evil in the Lord's sight and so provoking him to anger. Chapter 17 of Deuteronomy uh, and verse 2 to 5, uh, um, Moses says, if a man or woman living among you in one of the towns the Lord gives you in the is found doing evil in the eyes of the Lord, your God, in violation of his covenant, and contrary to my command, has worshipped other gods, bowing down to them or to the sun or moon or stars of heaven, then you must investigate it and put that person to death. So there, this is, these are the ways that this phrase is used uh, as we work through. It's always in connection with idolatry. And so too, you have it in the book of Judges, uh, uh, repeatedly, uh, in Judges chapter 2, verse 10 says, After that whole generation had been gathered to their fathers, another generation grew up who neither knew the Lord nor what he had done for Israel. Then the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord and served the Baals. And then that's repeated through Judges. And it, it, again, on each occasion, it's idolatry deserving death. I think it's very likely, given the way that phrase is used, that Ur has adopted Canaanite religion. Well, there he is. Judah has taken him away from the family. Remember, Jacob had said when they'd gone to Bethel, put away the foreign gods. Put away the foreign gods. Judah has taken his family away from that influence. I think it's most likely that Ur has adopted Canaanite religion. He's worshipping their gods. That's why he, uh, I think, is put to death. Onan, his brother, was selfish and defiant. He refused to do what his father told him to do, Lie with your brother's wife and fulfill your duty to her as a brother-in-law to produce offspring for your brother. Uh, that was a cultural thing and it becomes part of the law of Moses uh, to maintain uh, offspring for a brother who dies. The next brother is to uh, uh, produce offspring with the, the, the dead man's wife. He so he's defiant. He refuses to do what his father tells him to do. And he's selfish because uh, he doesn't want to give offspring. Uh, uh, that will be his brothers. He's defiant and selfish, refusing to do what his father told him to do and selfishly depriving his deceased brother of offspring. That's why they died, not because of Tamar, but because of their wickedness in the sight of the Lord. See, I think Judah is losing his moral sensitivity. The problems with Tamar... He can't see the wickedness of his own sons and what they've done. Which is a consequence of choosing the wrong influences. Our moral sensitivity will be dulled if we choose the wrong influences. He drew the wrong conclusions regarding the death of his sons. He was looking in the wrong direction. God had judged them. It doesn't seem to enter into Judah's thinking even. He chose the wrong influences, he drew the wrong conclusions, he engaged, thirdly, 
in the wrong practices. Tamar's plan to have the offspring that is her right, as she sees it, and as I think the culture suggests, she had a right to offspring. Uh, her plan to get offspring depends on Judah behaving in the way that she anticipates. She's going to uh, change uh, and disguise herself as a prostitute uh, and sit uh, uh, on the route that Judah is going to take. Therefore, she antici- her plan will only work if Judah goes to the prostitute. She appears to know that Judah will avail himself of a prostitute. That's a poor reflection on Judah's character, isn't it? When his daughter-in-law thinks that her plan's going to work because she knows that Judah is going to avail himself of a prostitute. Whether it's from high spirits because it's uh, sheep shearing season, which was a time of high spirits, but whether it's under the influence of Hira the Adullamite. It's interesting that Hira is with him. Did you notice that in verse 12? His friend Hira the Adullamite went with him. So as he makes this journey, as he passes this prostitute, Hira is with him and perhaps he encourages, yeah, go on, Judah, go on. Well, she uh, presents herself as a uh, prostitute. Uh, Judah uh, asks to... to, uh, use her services. Uh, What are you going to give me? Uh, A goat is promised. Give me a pledge that you'll send the goat uh, uh, in due course. These are highly personal items. He asks for his, um, sorry, the the pledge is given. Uh, It's his seal, sorry, verse 18, his seal and its cord. So he would have a, a seal which would be used in uh, uh, marking documents uh, uh, and, and so on that he would carry around his uh, neck, perhaps a little uh, a cylinder uh, with something on it that would be used for uh, imprinting on wax uh, or whatever it might be, or clay, his seal and his staff. Each man would have his own particular staff carved in a particular way uh, 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 as well to mark it offices. I suppose the equivalent today would you would give someone your debit card and your PIN number. That's how personal it was. And he gives them, yeah, there we are. Uh, and uh, uh, you can have these, and uh, when the goat comes, give them back. When Hira, his friend, is sent to reclaim the pledges, notice what he seeks. Verse 20, meanwhile, Judah uh, sent the young goat by his friend, the Adullamite, in order to get his pledge back from the woman but he did not find her. He asked the men who lived there, where is the shrine prostitute who was beside the road at Inaim? There hasn't been a shrine prostitute here, they said. So he went back to Judah and said, I didn't find her besides the men who lived there, said there hasn't been any shrine prostitute here. Hira, uh, Judah's friend, a native of the land, knows that Tamar didn't simply pose as a prostitute, but as a shrine prostitute, a sacred prostitute. This was part of Canaanite religion, that uh, uh, you would ensure the fertility of land and family of animals uh, by uh, employing such a prostitute. And it's a problem later in the history of Israel. But it's part of Canaanite religion. Judy, you see, is guilty not just of immorality, but immorality connected with false religion. This is how far Judah has fallen. It's not just immorality, it's false religion immorality. Which is a consequence of the influences that he chose. A further wrong practice on his part, was his hypocritical condemnation of Tamar. About three months later, verse 24, Judah was told, your daughter-in-law Tamar is guilty of prostitution, and as a result, she is now pregnant. Judah said, bring her out and have her burned to death. Very summary. Uh, Doesn't uh, investigate the crime. Could it not have been like their sister Dinah, back in chapter 34, who was forced... He doesn't even contemplate that. 
And Judah himself has just used a prostitute. It's hypocritical in terms of his own conduct and the lack of investigation into the crime. As she was being brought out, she sent a message to her father-in-law, I am pregnant by the man who owns these, she said. And she had to see if you recognise whose seal and cord and staff these are. Judah recognised them. There's an echo here from the end of chapter 37. Uh, the brothers took the ornamented robe back to their father and said, we found, this is verse 32 of chapter 37. They took the ornamented robe back to their father and said, we found this examine it to see whether it is your son's robe or literally see if you recognize if this is your son's robe jacob recognized it see if you recognize whose pledges these are and he recognized it faced with his fault judah confesses the very thing he'd refused to do with regard to Joseph. There's no denial, there's no excuse. Uh, Joe Biden's press secretary said this, this incident is not representative of who I am as a person. <laughs> well, you said it and you did it. Who is it representative of? No, Judah doesn't make any excuses. He doesn't say, no, this is not who I am. No, no, she is more righteous than I. And I think this chapter's put here because, you know, we, we ended the last chapter with Joseph being sold in Egypt. Well, let's get on with Joseph's story. No, no, let's just pause a moment and see what God is doing in the lives of uh, these other brothers and Judah in particular. Because here is an example, I believe, of what Jesus repeatedly says. Everyone who exalts himself will be humbled. Everyone who humbles himself will be exalted. Judah humbles himself here. She is more righteous than I, a Canaanite, a Canaanite woman who deliberately committed an immoral act, a Canaanite woman who committed an immoral act by posing as a shrine religious prostitute. He humbles himself. And he is exalted in the unfolding narrative now. Judah is exalted from being a callous calculating opportunist let's sell joseph let's sell him we can get some money and he's gone now he becomes a compassionate caring responsible son so in chapter 43 uh, uh, of genesis uh, when uh, they've got to the, the brothers have got to go back the second time and uh, they know that you can't come back unless, unless you bring benjamin with you Chapter 43, verse 8, Then Judah said to Israel, his father, Send the boy along with me, and we will go at once, so that we uh, and you and our children may live and not die. I myself will guarantee his safely, safety. You can hold me personally responsible for him. If I do not bring him back to you and set him before you, I will bear the blame before you all my life. Chapter 44, at the end of chapter 44, it's the longest speech in Genesis. It's Judah speaking to Joseph, pleading with Joseph, don't keep Benjamin here, it will, it will, it will kill my father. Chapter 44, verse 33, at the end of that speech, he says, Now then, please, let your servant remain here as my Lord's slave in place of the boy, and let the boy return with his brothers. He's a changed man. Chapter 46 and uh, verse 28, uh, as Jacob makes his way back down to Egypt, verse 28 of chapter 46, now Jacob sent Judah ahead of him to Joseph to get directions to Goshen. He trusts Judah. Judah's now responsible. That's a change because, it, because he humbles himself. Everyone who humbles himself will be exalted. He's exalted in the ongoing uh, narrative. He's exalted in Jacob's blessing of his sons at the end of Genesis, in Genesis 49. He doesn't have much to, good to say about Reuben. Uh, 
well, nothing good to say about Reuben, nothing good to say about Simeon and Levi. But what does he say about Judah? Genesis 49, verse 8. Judah, your brothers will praise you. Your hand will be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's sons will bow down to you. The scepter will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet until he comes to whom it belongs, and the obedience of the nations is his. Judah, you're going to have a place of prominence in the family, a place of leadership. He's exalted in that blessing. Judah is exalted in Jesus' family tree. You get a first glimpse of that in the book of uh, Ruth. Uh, in uh, Ruth chapter 4, at the end of that uh, wonderful story of Ruth uh, and Boaz. Uh, at the end of uh, Ruth in chapter 4, uh, uh, Boaz, yeah, I'm going to take Ruth to be my wife. Notice what they say in verse 7, uh, in verse 12, uh, sorry, in verse 11 of Ruth chapter 4. May the Lord make the woman who is coming into your home, this is, they're speaking to Boaz, may the Lord make the woman who is coming into your home like Rachel and Leah, who together built up the house of Israel. May you have standing in Ephrathah and be famous in Bethlehem. Through the offspring the Lord gives you by this woman, May your family be like that of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah. Really? Yeah. And then what do we read at the end of that uh, book in verse 18? This then is the family line of Perez, the child who was born to that immoral mixing. Perez was the father of Hezron. Hezron was the father of Ram. Ram, the father of Binadab. Abinadab, the father of Narshon. Narshon, the father of Salmon. Salmon, the father of Boaz. Boaz, the father of Obed. Obed, the father of Jesse. Jesse, the father of David. Matthew chapter 1, verses 1 and 3. A record of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac. Isaac, the father of Jacob. Jacob, the father of Judah and his brothers. Judah, the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar, and so on, to Jesus. Wow. <laughs> Jesus entered this dysfunctional family. He who humbles himself will be exalted. And if we humble ourselves under God's mighty hand, no matter what a mess we've made of things, God can use us in his great purpose and plan. If we humble ourselves under God's mighty hand, everyone who exalts himself will be humbled. I think Judah does that at the beginning of this passage. I don't need my family. I don't need this. I don't need that guilt on it. I can make my own way. I'll make my own friends. I'll marry my own wife. I'll go my own way. He was humbled. But he humbles himself. She is more righteous than I. And God graciously exalted him. Because God is at work in this family. As God is at work in every one who humbles themselves under God's mighty hand. It's a tale of Judah's failings, but it's a tale of God's grace as he works to mould this man into the man he would have him be and work through this family to bring Jesus, the saviour of the world. Let's pray. Lord, please help us to humble ourselves, to give our pride, or to give our self-sufficiency and self-assurance. Forgive us, Lord, for the mistakes we've made. But thank you, Lord, that the vilest offender who truly believes that moment from Jesus a pardon receives. Everyone who humbles himself will be exalted. Amen.
We're going to sing a song of humility. Above